Pino no give I'm gonna tell y'all one thing that I know for a fact. And he, rest in peace, Easy D. One thing about Eric, Ax told me one day, I thought, I thought Andre did all the music, yeah, all the beats. All right, whoop. You know what Eric told me? Huh? People send our demos in. Andre redo them. We redo the raps. Yeah. That's the song. All right. I took that same get out. So basically, I took it from Easy. It did the same shit. I took it from Easy and took it to another level. All right. And guess what? Jimmy Iovine sent me to prison and stole it from me. Yeah. Have you ever seen a motherfucking CEO from a record company all of a sudden be joined to the hip with Andre? They dressing like they doing headphones together, they doing headphones together, all for what? Universal money? Yeah. Have you ever in your life seen a person like Doug Morris give Puffy $35, $40 million to do an album? And guess what? Then they're not labeled, not flop. Did none of the rest, records do anything? Yeah. Did they not drop him because of that? Yep. So how is the fact that Jimmy Iovine, who's Doug Morris, protege, turn around and give Puppy the same deal for the same amount of money? Yeah, and guess what? That's fly. You know one thing about me. I don't care any n Hollywood and any n on the streets, especially Hollywood rappers. Yeah. We can get our paperwork. Yeah. And see what all we ever been arrested for. Mom, I guarantee bro, you, you there's never been nothing for me but straight real shit and violence. Ain't no, you ain't snitching. No, no, I don't, I ain't never in my life told. You, you'll you have a 90 mother walk down the street and said, Suge Knight killed Tupac. <laughs> well, everybody know off the top, I ain't the nigga killed Tupac, I'm the nigga who protected the nigga Tupac. Yeah. But at the same time, bitch ass Puffy can give him a mother star and shit, every rat in the world said he didn't want to kill Tupac. Yeah. Or had him shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you notice, it was a rap on television saying he the one did the shooting, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened, right? Right. If you think about it, right? Right. Why you think nobody been arrested if they said they the one killed Tupac? So they do this, uh, you know, this performance, the Source Awards, and there's a picture of Pac, as you in, say, in the, in, the, in, in the jail cell. That's what, and he was signed. Most people don't know the deal was executed. Yeah, he was already signed and at that point. Shug, I mean, Pac knew he was on his way home. Yeah. On the pill bond. So Suge gets presented, you know, the label of the year award. Yeah. He gets on the mic and he basically disses Puffy. Correct. You guys go to the tunnel afterwards. Correct. And then Puffy and Suge run into each other? They didn't run it. Well, yeah. They, I mean, we went to the tunnel knowing that they were going to be there. Yeah. But they came over. Puffy talked to him. You know, people around not know what the conversation was. So it, it seemed to be tense. But, you know, puffy, sure. <laughs> I really couldn't believe it because homeboy, me and him were, were, were f friends. But th at that day, it was tense. Everybody was talking. and But Sugar and Puffy were cool at one point. I, I'd have been over with Sugar at Puffy office, but we done missed planes where they want to talk. Sugar, yes. yeah, yeah. He would wow. pick me up from the airport. Wow. You know. I've never heard this before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we got to break some news here. He picked wow. me up from the airport, the whole entire thing. And um, so to make a long story short, you know, this is where the after party's at, of course, at this world famous tunnel. Right. And so then when I had at, I ran up and I asked him and he said, nah, I was talking about Jermaine Dupri. Oh, he was talking about me. Right, right. Yeah, that, right. yeah. Well, no, I which, guess we got an Which side do you think is this a little? Mm. Come on, man. Y'all know better than that. That's not. That's not. I mean, I, we was there. I was. Right. I was there. At that point, I was scared because I know that the wolves that was with me, mm. they was like real live wolves, and mm. yeah, I got in. I didn't. I didn't get in to hurt anybody. Him and Puffy was was at it before Tupac even touched ground in L.A., and I think Puffy just wasn't biting into the shit. We lost the homeboy, Big Jake, out there. Uh, got killed in the shooting. You know what I'm saying? Shug sure came home. How the fuck is that? Shit that people don't know is that that beef between Puff and Shug started at my birthday party. Okay. Whoa. Segway. Facts. Okay. Wow. Like, I mean, it started at the Source Awards, but I'm saying for, for like get, some real once it got real. So, you, so you're saying like, like Big and maybe Pop might have been like <clears throat> they ain't had nothing to do with this yeah but it, it affected like it's yeah it went into that but they ain't had nothing to do with this right. this was all like ceo to ceo wow. shit. that's what i'm saying like i invited suge to my birthday party suge uh -huh. came to my birthday party with just him and his one dude uh -huh. 
I invited Puff to my birthday party. Puff came with the whole Bad Boy crew. All right. <clears throat> they had beef from that from that source shit. Right. But I wasn't ever even thinking like it was no real beef. I wouldn't right. even invite it. I wasn't thinking about it like that. Right. But the whole night went. The party was great. Beautiful party. Everybody had a good time. Then we went to this after party. Mm. We went to the after party. I guess Puff and Suge had some kind of like saying, said something to each other before mm. whatever at my party. Mm. So they got to this after party, Suge came to the club and Puff went outside. They were in the middle with Puff the and middle, Suge? The middle middle of the street, Puff and Suge. Wow. Outside in Atlanta. That, and this is at your party? Yeah. Is it a calm conversation or they? No, nah, it's not a calm oh, conversation. Okay. okay. Um, but it's not a just hostile, them. It's a very hostile conversation. Okay. And their crews is, 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 is. Ain't no crew. I mean, Suge oh, wow. has got one person. Oh. Puff got a crew. Oh, Suge okay. got one dude with him. Okay. Right? Okay. Suge was in some shady shit, doing too much, and trying to flex. And he couldn't, he didn't have his bodyguards like he normally had. And so he was out there thinking people is like really scared of him now. He couldn't take advantage of that this time. Puffy them went biting into that shit this time. Right, they had their own. Yeah, they, they, he had they killers had too. He yeah, had right. people with yeah, the He had guys too. like Wolf and, and everything else. That was ready to go. Yeah. And all I know is Puff started drinking his champagne mm. while they was talking and Street I guess somebody champagne. must have said something to him. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, you know, Wolf, rest in peace, you know, mm. he let off a shot and mm. let off a couple of shots and Suge Man got killed right there. Wow. In Atlanta. Wow. God that was bless. the beginning of that whole shit. You're working with Death Row, and then Pac comes out of prison and joins. Correct. And you were there as that's happening. I think he stayed in New York for a day, okay. to be honest, when he got released. Yeah. And then he got on a plane. I don't know, I forget how that happened, but I remember picking him up about 5 p.m. 6 p.m. on on a day, his first day from being, you know, coming to L.A. Okay, but when he came, it was like, uh, you know, from the day he came out of jail, from the, from the from the day he got off the plane, he pulled up to the back door, man, and fell fell out. Actually, he fell out. The first thing he did was fall out. He like passed out completely, like bam. And they think he did a whole bunch of songs that day. <laughs> Pac didn't. I guess he. He was so excited or not excited, for lack of a better word, but happy or feeling good, where they were smoking and drinking. He had a seizure that night. And, and, and hit, the, hit the ground, and they picked him up, started putting water on him. He had too much to drink and too much to smoke all at once. And um, like I said, this was probably like 5 o'clock when his plane landed. Probably by 9, 9.30, he had a seizure that night where Myself and his security that I assigned him to that day was named Kevin Hackey. Uh, we had to get him and take him to the Peninsula Hotel and get him checked into his room, where he eventually stayed for about two to three months. And when he came to, he went into the studio, man, and Pac didn't come out. I've been in the studio since um, the day after I got out. I came to the Friday. I got out Thursday. I've been here since Friday. Mm -hmm. He would be passing out, so I'd be like, okay, I guess we gotta go home now. So then we go home, come back early in the morning, and do it again. I think we broke a record this time for any recording. I'm trying to do the album in less than a week so I can call my album Seven Days. <laughs> but um, we did 13 tracks, 13 tracks in four days. It's different than any other album I came with so far. This one might throw a lot of people off because I just, I just blacked out. This one is like, this album is a reaction to the backlash from C. Deluxe's tour, C. Dolores Tucker, um, Bob Doe, all those people that just kept sweating me about the music. Now, it's, I feel as though this album is something for them to sweat. Do it. Let me tell you the idea. It's like where like we start like this youth league, right? Basketball, football, softball, for girls and boys. I'm gonna get all the rappers to adopt the team, get the field we play. We have like the church come out and sell food. That's real. We had the fathers and the uncles and all of the men in the community, they do security. Right. Get their respect back for 
the kids and Straight everything. Up. Then we had an FOI come out. We had a deacon from the church. They do security. And we just play football, baseball. You know, get that community spirit going again. I'm with then it, on the weekends, we have block parties. All right. Every, every rapper got to get up. Every rapper, nigga, if you got a record out, you got to get up for us. You got to come to a free show for the hood. That's real. And it's like a little tour. We, so we do that. We get all the communities back together. Now, I'm talking to Al Sharpton about this. Some other motherfuckers with some power. And then when we do that, we register the voters. And if we can yeah. register them for a Democrat, Republican, or Independent. Yeah. Once we register the voters, we have power. Then we start going up to the mayors of these cities and telling them, look, we got this many voters in this city. We want you to do this. We want um, a community center. We start hitting up Nike for the free clothes, the computer yeah. stores for the free computers for each community center. And if they don't, then shit, that's how many people we have in those cities we can regulate. I'm going to have all these tough-ass supposed to be gangster rappers that we're going to drive to all these drug areas right we asking you not telling you we asking you as a player to a player can you please give us a pass to have these streets clean from 6 p.m to 11 p.m 6 a.m to 11 p.m right. let that be for the kids let them the niggas be safe during those times no gunshots no drug dealers from 11 p.m to 6 a.m y'all can have the streets back hey, but, and you know what else too though when i talk to you face to face i'm gonna drop some shit on you right some other stuff too right mm -hmm. but yeah that's that man you know i'm with all that right and, um, you know, that's, the, that's my type of work. Yeah, we need power, man. I'm telling you. Hey, dig it, man. How's so, mom's doing? She doing good. She, we just had a show in Vegas. Did she? We had a big-ass show in Vegas, me and the dog, because I'm on death row now. Yeah, hey, man, congratulations. Thanks. Man. You happy over there? Yes, all right, so far. So, all right, oh, let me tell you. Hold on one second. All right. <laughs> but what Suge really got a bad taste with Puffy, and when he was already kind of not feeling Puffy, was because it was a fight. And we were already having Club 662 six open when we were doing the parties at the club. And Biggie was hot. And Suge asked Puffy to have Bibi, Biggie to come and perform at the, uh, at the club. And I think Puffy demanded something like the door, where Suge just thought he should have just got a fee. And, and at that point, Suge just told him, I don't know, well, I'll have the doll pound or I'll have somebody else perform. But when that conversation happened, I think the big Jake incident happened with J at the Jermaine Dupree uh, party. Before Tupac came on, uh, so it was a little bit before Tupac, but that incident, all of this stuff happened after the Source Awards, okay. which we know the Source Awards was in August of 95. Okay. You know, you also hear about the incident of Suge making someone drink piss. That happened allegedly at a, uh, a, a Christmas party. Okay. Where uh, one of Mark, I think his name was Mark Anthony Bell or something like that. One of uh, a guy that was working for uh, Puffy and Show, Puffy and Death Row. He was yes. working with Street Team. If yeah. I knew anything about Street Team guys back then. They they were independent contractors that worked projects for every record company that was hot at the time, especially the urban record companies. Mm -hmm. um, that incident was later found, or I think he signed a agreement and a settlement where he said she wasn't one of the ones that was uh, Dr. Dre and a couple of other people that were the ones that, uh, that, was, that had assaulted him. Okay. Well, but wasn't there some sort of altercation that happened where Suge and Puffy were the same club and Big Suge's Big. friend gets killed? Because I remember there was some sort of, uh, I think it was like the Biggie and Tupac series that they kind of reenacted it. Yeah. There's the scene where Suge is like blaming Puffy for for the you know indirectly for the death of his friend or something like that. Yeah, he he blamed uh, Puffy or his boy Wolf, Wolf. in on an entourage for that incident. Okay, Wolf is now dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I got it. So so now it's really it's really it's now. personal now. And then we have the the shooting. Where Biggie get on the radio and pump up uh, the Doll Pound trailer getting shot up. Right. This and is then, like December yeah. of 95. Yeah, right. So all and of then, this is going yeah. on. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the Dog Pounder filming in New York, New York, Correct. Brooklyn. Biggie gets on the radio, Hot 97. We heard him when we was in Times Square. We heard him on the radio. And he was telling his boys that uh, we was out there disrespecting their stomping grounds. Wait, so he was on the radio? Saying this on the radio on Hot 97, live on the radio, and they let him, they let him like it was the chat line. So that happened the next day. Wait, so so the Red Hook Brooklyn incident happened the next day. He was on the phone the day before. We was filming okay, in Red Hook Brooklyn, and we was in a trailer, and you just saw, you just seen. Psh. 
And where did it hit? The first bullet came through the window. and Which window? The window behind me. I was sitting facing the door. And then, psh, and then we all looked at each other. Another bullet come through the window. I said, oh, so they shooting. Because I heard the first one, but I didn't make it out. I'm like, and I heard something like, Tick. And Dog said, they shooting, cuz. Bang, everybody got on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the security opened the door and said, where's Snoop? Where's Snoop? All you heard was crickets. And he says, it's, it's, it's Frank. Snoop said, man, get the fuck off of me. Here I am. Man, let's get the fuck out of here, man. Let's go. Move. Get off me. Move. Stop touching me, man. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Fired up the van, snatched everybody out. So what's in the van, told us to stay down, shot back to uh, Jersey. We was living in, we was, uh, in the hotel in Jersey and got them, like, flights up out of there within the next couple of hours. Got in that car. We was out. Went back to L.A., so sad, real sad, sitting at Snoop's house. Didn't even talk to each other for about a week. I had to stay till the next day. You know, I did damage control on the radio. You know, New York, y'all be having snipers. <laughs> People be on top of them rooftops and be like, oh, y'all want to, this one, two, two, two. And they, they sharpshooters, man. Y'all got some good shooters out here, because I don't know how you hit the window <laughs> directly. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Nobody got hit, though. Nobody got hit, thank God. And then so y'all decided... And we was just sitting there, yeah. and one day Snoop woke up and said, man, get up. Called DJ Pooh and said, man, check this out, man. We finna kick over every building in New York. <laughs> it happened in this Los Angeles park. Snoop's bodyguard shot and killed 24-year-old Philip Walter Merriam. Snoop didn't pull the trigger, but he, the bodyguard, and a third man were all charged with murder because prosecutors say they hunted down Walter Merriam after an earlier argument. Snoop's attorney claims self-defense and says the DA has an agenda. But the charges haven't hurt his career. In fact, some accuse the rapper of making crime pay, as Reed Galen reports in tonight's Eye on America. As Calvin Broadus leaves the court where he has just appeared on murder charges, little kids clamor for his autograph. What's your name? What's your name? They know him as rapper Snoop Doggy Dog. I'm just an inspiration. You look to me as inspiration. A chilling thought to critics of music ripe with violence and to the family of the victim. My brother has become just a nameless, faceless commodity in the interest of record companies profiting from his blood. I, there will be no outbursts in this courtroom. The next sound from anyone is out the door. Go ahead. That's Calvin Brothers. We, the jury in above entitled action, find a defendant, Calvin Brothers, not guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. In violation of Penal Code Section 187, a felony, as charged in count one of the indictment. Dated February 13, 1996. Charles B. Foster, four person. If you hear about a lot of the artists, used to be some of them used to be on death row, some on other labels. You might hear them um, getting caught with drugs, getting caught with a gun, stab somebody, do those type of crimes, and they're gonna come to prison. One of the reasons they're not gonna come. Like to Snoop, prison. Or? Oh, well, Snoop would never come. I mean, Snoop was on, you know, we beat a murder trial for him, but then he was on probation. Then he got caught with two ounces of marijuana. Then he got caught with guns, and each time it's nothing. They're not gonna violate him. Because for the street guys, the street guys know what I'm talking about. There's no puzzle. I mean, if you get a guy that constantly getting in trouble and never gonna come to prison, that's because he's an informant, he's a rat, a snitch. Yeah. You know, and they're more important to the police on the streets than in here, because they let them know what's going on. They might say they sold by telling on three or four, or five other guys. You know, I'm from Compton, and I'm a rat is the lowest you can go. A rat will do anything. But you know, the snoop was a rat. I mean, did things change once uh, Tupac arrived? Well, <sighs> Suge stopped hanging out with Danny Boy as much. And Dre and Suge never really hung out going to clubs and stuff. We would see them, at, you know, at the House of Blues. We would bump into Dre and Bruce and his security guy. Uh, um, you know, at clubs and stuff like that. But to say that they were hanging out 
and going out together and stuff like that. No, that's, that, that wasn't their relationship at all. Mm -hmm. and mainly because Dre was mainly on house arrest at the time as well. But Shug and Pac was together when you're going out to clubbing and stuff like that. Every every time they, they went out to a club, to the house. And the, mainly the only club we went to was the House of the Blues, to be honest. We didn't go to, you know, Roxy or Bar One. Shug and I would go to Bar One a few times on Sunday nights, but uh, they wasn't hanging out like that. Um, and so, um, yeah. Okay, so Pac and Shug got real close. They, they were real close. Okay. And at one point, Dre wanted to leave. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was all behind Michelle A. But... Right, because Dre had a baby with Michelle A. Correct. And Michelle A started messing with Shug. She was the one that was telling Shug about Dre exit plan and all of that. Oh, really? So, so, so Shug was already hearing things. The conflict was Dre didn't want to be around all those criminals. And eventually it got to the point where Dre just stopped doing anything. You know, you, know, you, can, you can almost see, if you, if you look at um, the work that was done by, by Death Row, you can almost see Dre, 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 then no Dre. Yeah. And even for a lot of the things where Dre still got credit, he wasn't the producer. There were other younger guys. Dads and, yeah. Right. All these guys. Um, and so, so Dre just kind of absented himself from the process and refused to, to do anything. And so that's why he escalated some, the escape plan with, through Jimmy Iovine. See, Jimmy is the one that Shug was like saying, hey, get rid of this guy. You got to make something happen. This dude is, and so they both used Jimmy Iovine to, to make that split happen. Right. And then Tupac came in the picture and it took Death Row to a whole other level. On that level. Yeah. So then Dre leaves Death Row. I think he had left it mentally and, uh, you know, long before he actually left legally. Okay. And Jimmy Iovine ends up, from what I understand, giving Dre a chunk of money and basically financing Aftermath. Fa exactly. And from what I understand, Jimmy wrote Dre a hell of a check. <laughs> To uh, leave? You know, to eventually, you know, f form a company directly within it. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, he helped him out. I'd heard oh. like a hundred million or something. No, like it wasn't that much. Uh, I remember, because Jimmy and I were very close. We used to talk a lot. And at one point, uh, Dre was after the firm and everything. Before Eminem came, he was $21 million unrecouped. Mm. And that's when he had to downsize his house, move out to the valley. And all of that because Jimmy couldn't take care of him like he was supposed to because Edgar Boffman was on him, which was the new company that had just bought Universal. Uh, and, and, and Jimmy couldn't do the things that he, want, that he used to could do for Dre. So Dre had to take a drastic uh, downsize. So what happened with the Soul Train Awards? Soul Train Music Awards. Um, well, what happened was... Um, Sugar, we, we went through the back. It was, uh, Sugar was driving one car, uh, then he was in the Hummer, and I think he had Tupac and some of the outlaws uh, in, the, in the Hummer with him. Myself and Frank Alexander, the, the security that was assigned to Tupac, was behind them. Uh, we were initially uh, trying to bring in our entourage, we were like 50 deep. <laughs> Don Cornelius was very smart. He uh, said, hey, only one's coming in this back. <laughs> the back gate is, you know, Tupac, you know, and Shug and their security. Everybody else have to go around towards the front, mm -hmm. which, thank God, that's what happened because we'd probably all still be in a penitentiary if um, we all would have came back there because we had about 50 the guys with us in some t-shirts that all said, I believe he had, they had Bompton on it, mm. or, or it may have been P-Funk, one or two. What does P-Funk mean? Pyro Funk, like, oh, okay. funk, like, you know, for the Pyro's. Got it. And so he had a bunch of guys with him because the plan was, their plan at that time was, I believe, that I overheard that they were going to rush the stage and pull Biggie off that stage that particular day. Uh, 
but they were forewarned, the security there, um, because I knew the guy that ran the security by the name of Keith Davis, and they didn't allow them in into the into the facility. Pac had an encounter with Big. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. What, what the, mean? the Shrine Theater in the L.A. Yeah, that one. Yeah. How, what can you tell us? Because there's, it's, 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 people got, got it misconstrued how real the beef was, man. It was real. And there's no secret about it. Everybody know that it was real. People think that it was, uh, you know, just to sell records. Oh, no, hell no. No, I mean, I was in bulletproof vests every day with security. I heard that particular day guns came out. I mean, you know, that, that happened That happened some, a lot. <laughs> that happened a lot. But, you know, before, it, it really not really. That day I'm there, we was walking in the crowd, and we, we were just pretty deep. One funny thing I heard is, like, Puff went, uh, first thing Puff did was ran, run. Uh, I mean, the whole entourage that was with him kind of went the other way. But you had to. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> you got like 60, 70 guys coming to you, muscles and shit. And you in their city and you in their neighborhood, it's, it's, it's probably time to leave. <laughs> yeah. So now, Puff behind me, and next thing you know, he dips to the left, and I see him jump over the, down into the embankment and just start running. So Shugnam is coming up. They about... 40, 50 feet, a little bit long. I guess they ain't see him because, you know, I'm a big dude. So I just played the wall, and they walked by me. They didn't know who I was. And if they did, they ain't say nothing. Cause he goes up, he start going up the steps. Now I get on the phone with Chaz Williams, who's over Black Hand. So I'm explaining the whole situation to Chaz about, you know, what just happened at Soul Train. And Chaz says, yeah, I said, yo, man, I told these niggas, I told this nigga Puff, I got these dudes. And um, he took off running. And Puff was way upstairs, and I didn't even think he heard me. Puff said, yo, Gene, who you talking to? I said, Chaz, why? He said, why you telling my ran? I ain't run. You should have just told him I took a left. And Puff was like, yo, Gene, I got like 127 employees. All these people depend on me for their livelihood. He said, if those white folks even think or knew that I had anything to do with any kind of gunplay, they're not going to fuck with me. They're not going to spend no money with me. You understand? He said, but I'm tired of living like this. And as he was going up the steps, this came out of his mouth verbatim. He said, I don't give a fuck if Pop gotta die. I don't give a fuck if Big gotta die. I don't give a fuck if Suge Knight gotta go to jail. I'm tired of living my life like this, and something got to change. Was, was Dre already on the way out when, when you guys arrived? Hey, I mean, it was, it was talks just, about it. You just, were here, you about, were here. Yeah. You know what I mean? But every time we see, I, I seen Dre, I didn't see, I didn't see that. You know what I mean? I didn't see that. Like, one of the last conversations I'll never forget was on the set of California Love, and you know, um, Dre her hit him up and was like, yo, I love that fucking record. I want to shoot the video. I want to direct it. Wait, wait, wait. Hit him up was already recorded when California Love. The first We had version? a version of it. Yeah. We had a version of about it. About Biggie? Yeah, about a lot of people. Before he even got out of jail. Oh. We had planned that record. Sitting down in Danamora. This is what I'm going to do when I get out. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. You know what I mean? I say that on Life of an Outlaw. You know what I mean? Six months in advance before we planned it. Because we had planned, you know what I mean? He was in there thinking. Nigga got a lot of time on his hands. So he got out, he a lot of his moves shit. was already planned. Uh -huh. And he just went, came out and implemented each one of them. So everything is a, is a mess at this point. Correct. And then Tupac drops, hit him up. We bust some bad boys, niggas fuck for life. Plus, Puffy trying to see me weak. Hearts I rip. Picky Smalls and Junior Mark. Well, uh, well, he did a little things before that. You, you remember the skit before Two of America Most Wanted? You're head of security. Are you worried at this point? That's hip hop <laughs> in my mind at that time. That's, that's this rap stuff. That's this gangster rap. Because it wasn't really an East Coast, West Coast thing at that nah. point. Nah, man. We stayed partying on the West East Coast. You know, most of our guys was out there. Eric B and, you know, a lot, a lot of dudes that hung around us were, were living in, uh, from New York, from the East Coast. So I'm not knowing. I'm not that smart. 
I'm not catching it. I'm not saying, hey, you know, this this is getting too deep. I'm not. Yeah. And I'm 28 years of age. I'm not that smart. Right. I'm but you're not also that wise. not the, you're also not the decision maker. <laughs> I could have did anything. At all. That's what people be like. Well, Tupac should have been riding like this, or yeah. These guys not going to ride like this. They're going to ride in the car with whoever they want to ride in. Right. They're not going to be riding in the car with security. Okay. <laughs> well, you're talking about the, the New York, New York video shoot, right? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you feel that things got more serious at death row? No, nah, it was already serious, man. I wasn't even there for that, but it was already serious. It was serious before that happened. It was serious. It was, oh. it was always serious. So you would actually go outside with a bulletproof vest all the time? Every day. I had a, uh, a security guard that... I wasn't able, especially going towards the end, I wasn't able to move around without security at all. I knew Pac Rap star Tupac Shakur is in a hospital recovering from serious gunshot wounds as a New York jury deliberates his faith regarding sexual abuse charges. I mean, and that's what kills me. It's like every time I think this is it and I go all out to beat that, I win. Mm -hmm. Or I lose, and then I come into the next one. It's, it's worse. It's even worse. Like it's like a, a like the Twilight Zone, because it's like some evil, unstoppable shit that it just won't let me go. Mm -hmm. It's just got his hands on me, and it just want to see me fail. He knew like it's gonna come one day where when I start putting out this. Besides, Brenda's got a baby, their mama, and when I get really like political on them, I'm be a target, and then. What hurt him the worst is like the New York incident where he got robbed in the studio. Quad Studios. Yeah, he just, he, he's like, man, I'm, for all I do and rep, represent for my people, I just never thought my own people would shoot me. When a white cat pulled a gun on me, I was prepared. You know what I mean? I don't see react. I'm when a nothing. nigga pulled a gun on me, I like froze up like, oh shit, a nigga gonna kill me? When them dudes put out the pistols to me, man, who was that, man? It was these fools from New York, this gang out there called A Team. These man. fools was mad because I, I told them I wasn't fucking with them no more. See, the girl that did this rape shit, she hooked up with the niggas that shot me. Oh, is that right? It's all connected. It was a big plan. I just caught it like at the end, and that's why they shot me. Man, hey man, you gotta stay up, man. When you when you step through that that way, man, you gotta be on point. Bro. I ain't going through there no more. If I do, I'm going with a hundred motherfuckers. Yeah, I'll be one of them. Yeah. No doubt, because no we, we can't be having you not here. Well, you had mentioned that when Pac was in the hospital, he felt like the doctors were going to poison him mm. through through the needles and, and stuff like that. He just became really paranoid. Yeah, I mean, Mama Feeney was like, when I came to the hospital, she's like, yo, please talk to him. He, they saying if he leave, he wants to check himself out. An infection could kill him. So I said, all right, Mom, I'm going to come talk to him. So when I came up in, he was like, I know what you're going to say, fuck that, I need to go. I said, all right, we're going to go. I heard there was an actress that he stayed with right after the hospital. Do you know who that was? No, if I did, I want to say it. Okay. You know, I ran off to the hospital, like, no matter what's going on, I'm still here for you, and I love you, I care. So I was there, but I got there too late. So you heard about the Quad Studio shooting a day later, you went to the hospital to try to see Tupac, but once you got there, Tupac wasn't there. If I'm not mistaken, Tupac went to Jasmine Guy House, right? Right after he left the hospital. First of all, he was shot five times. Somebody wanted him dead. And walking around knowing that yeah. really affected Tupac's spirit. Yeah. Um, there was fear. Yeah. There was a lot of mistrust, almost like anybody involved with his recuperation had to go underground to even deal because nobody had to could know anything because he was he was sure the people that shot him knew him, that it mm -hmm. wasn't a random mugging. Not five. No. Not five shots. Mm -mm. He didn't want to stay in the hospital or at his girlfriend's house. So um, they called me to see if I could keep him while he was convalescing from the, the wound. And he didn't, he didn't feel safe sitting up in the hospital bed. Tupac Shakur has been sentenced to a maximum of four and a half years in prison for sexually abusing a fan. A state judge in New York condemned 23 -year -old, the 23-year-old rapper for his, quote, arrogant abuse of the victim and crimes he said had escalated as Shakur's career progressed. Once he was in jail, though, uh, they put him in solitary confinement. Yeah. They used all forms of... Uh, uh, tactics that are called by Amnesty International penal coercion tactics mm -hmm. to mess his head up. So most of our population 
uh, probably still believes that Tupac was some gangster who uh, you know got killed because of a gang rift or because of this you know manu what I call manufactured East Coast versus West Coast rap rivalry. I worked hard all my life as far as this music business to make it East Coast, West Coast love and make everybody feel comfortable. And I dreamed of the days when I can go to New York and be comfortable and they can come out here and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm, I'm, when people say, why are you doing it in East Coast City? It's not like it's, it's not silly at all, mm -hmm. but you can't disrespect the love. You can't disrespect the peace treaty. I bumped into Stretch in the club one night and he was like, oh, Dad, what's up? Because I knew him. You know, I met him from day one when I met Pac. He was there. And, you know, I would always see him. He tells me that uh, Pac, he's sure Pac would love to know that he ran into me because we lost contact and he had no way of getting in contact with me. I said, okay. So I gave him my phone number. I told him, call me. He called me, told me he had a message for me from Pac, you know. So I said, come through. I'm living in Brooklyn and Best Buy at the time. I'm like, come through. This man shows up to my house with some dudes from Junior Mafia and some dudes from Bedford Avenue. And I'm just like, okay, because from what I'm getting, I haven't spoke to Pac, but, you know, the radio interviews and what's going on, the, the atmosphere is that there's a problem between Big and Pac, that Pac feels like, you know, Big has something to do with him getting shot and that thing. So I'm not really knowing what's going on here at this point, but that already looked fishy to me. Then Stretch comes under the pretense that he got a message for me from Pac. There's no message, though. It's just him trying to holler at me, you know, and that was the second flag. So, you know, after I spoke to him for a little while, I shut him down, told him that wasn't going to happen. You know, that prompted me to contact Pac because I'm like, this your boy. What's he doing with your enemies, people? And why is he trying to holler at me? Uh, there was anonymous letters going back and forth. There was uh, strangers making uh, outrageous accusations. And, uh, and so, yeah, Tupac started believing some of this stuff um, at first. And then you know, by the end of his life, he didn't believe it anymore. He realized uh, that in his last album, uh, Machiavelli, yeah. he had a song called Against All Odds, where he says, let me you know, uh, tell you about this snitch, you know, I mean, an FBI agent named Haitian Jack knew he was working for the feds. Of course, Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, uh, set me up and wet me up. Yeah. And the set him up was for the sexual assault scene, and that wet me up was where shot him at New York Recording Studio Lobby because it was an associate of Agnant, of Jacques Agnant, Haitian Jacques Agnant, that uh, lured Tupac to that New York Recording Studio Lobby where he was shot. Um, there was, uh, I have a doctor's affidavit uh, copied in my book showing that there was two bullet uh, entry wounds in the back of the skull and two exit wounds in the front of the skull. Yeah. And they just bare, those bullets barely missed his brain. They, uh, they, suspected, they suspected that, for example, Haitian Jacques Ignant was bad news. And they told Tupac, you know, we're not sure about him, him. We don't know his origins. We don't know what he's really about. But Tupac was having all kinds of problems at that time. Uh, financially, legally, obviously, they kept arresting him with, and I, I think that was part of their same strategy they used against the Panthers, the what's called a, the harassment arrest strategy that was yeah. found in FBI documents. And what it turns out is, that, of course, that it was eventually found out that he had a, a miles long rap sheet of uh, charges up and down the East Coast, according to Tupac's New York trial lawyer, Michael Warren, who got that rap sheet. And, uh, and all the charges were dismissed. And Michael Warren said that's a sure sign of a police intelligence agent. They just didn't realize how much U.S. intelligence, you know, how many resources they would put into targeting Tupac. And all I was doing was like, give me my proper etiquette. I got shot. I'm like, yo, what happened? Come see me in jail. Biggie all in the air to my ear pockets, my whole boy wound, but not seeing me. My whole boy Stretch is going to Biggie's concerts. Niggas is like abandoning me. Mm -hmm. Niggas is just going to act like I'm going to just be in jail and they're going to give me shout outs and try to take my position. Mm -hmm. And if you watch, that's what Biggie did. Listen to his, I, I, I was there, nigga, I trained the nigga, he used to be under me like my lieutenant. The nigga, I used to come in New York, I used to do shows and let the nigga come on before I did keep your head up and get around. Because mm -hmm. nobody knew the nigga in New York. Mm -hmm. 
And I used to tell a nigga, yo, if you hey, want to make your money, I'm, I'm, you got to rap for the bitches. Do not rap for the niggas. Yeah, I told a yeah. nigga, don't rap for the niggas. The rap for the from. bitches. The bitches will buy your records and the niggas want what the bitches want. So all of a sudden, he changed from being, listen to party and bullshit. Listen to his style. He changed from that to Big Pop. Yeah. Because of me. He had my album, Me Against the World, was the second one. He had the first one. I changed everything because Ready to Die came out and it sounded like my album. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be, he was supposed to be thug life. Mm -hmm. All while he was coming up, I used to let him come on stage with me. He was screaming thug life. Hey, cause I he was like, I hate Canadian. Brooklyn, I hate New York. I'm out with them niggas puppy cheating me. Woo, woo, woo. All of a sudden he blew up and he wasn't saying thug life. Mm -hmm. So I started getting mad and I was seeing the niggas place. He was hugging me, yo, Puck. Yo, thank you, he's the only nigga that woo, woo, woo. But he, and he told me like about a week before I got shot. He knew the nigga that was shot me and he was like, Pop, don't hang around this nigga. You know what I mean? You know, we walked in with the nigga that shot me and ended up shooting me. He's like, Pop, don't fuck with this nigga because I knew the nigga too. He was my Kogi mm -hmm. fan. And uh, I was like, What you mean? He's like, I'll talk to you about it later. And we didn't talk. Ne the next time I saw him was at the studio where I got shot. So I knew he knew what happened. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Biggie, what happened? He kept sending me messages like a bitch, you know, like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna come see you. No, nigga, what happened? While I'm in jail, strangers is telling me, Yo, you don't know? Biggie Homeboy shot you. So now they rapping against me, and you, you can imagine how I fucking feel. Mm -hmm. When, when I got arrested you, in New York, I got arrested for Biggie. Them guns in my room was Biggie's guns, because them cowards left the room when they heard the police was downstairs, and everybody left their guns in my room. So I got four guns in my room. Serial numbers scratched out, and I did not since I took that case. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how I feel. When I'm in jail for that case, and he out there living a mafia lifestyle, giving me no money, giving me no respect, giving me no tribute, rolling with my road dog who was there when I got shot. I mean, come on, man. I'm not paranoid. Mm -hmm. I'm not paranoid. Nah, nah, Y'all niggas know what time it is. Yeah, I would, I would say Pac always knew. I think he knew Big. See, a lot of people get it confused when he knew Biggie didn't really do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. We knew Biggie wasn't a gangster. Yeah. You know what I mean? He probably come from the hood, but he wasn't built like that. But Pac was upset that word on the streets and even when he went in prison is that Biggie and them knew this was going to happen. Had, uh, had knowledge of yeah, it. Yeah, they had knowledge of it. And also word on the street is that they was going to try to take advantage. They thought Pac was going to get killed. That and they're gonna drop this who shot you or they they was gonna they want to be in the studio when Pac get shot or killed and they're just gonna help their careers mm. this is what Pac was getting fed you understand mm. now um soon he gets shot biggie put out this song who shot you mm. and it sounded like it was aimed at Pac. so Pac in jail like man something it would just even if he didn't do it on purpose it was bad timing yeah so they were basically torturing him in jail messing his head up and then when he got out of jail um he he was with Death Row Records, who I argue and show evidence of that continued these tactics to mess his head up. And uh, only when he was finally getting away from Death Row Records uh, did he get back into some of his activist lyrics. And uh, he had started his own record company, his own film company, and um, had fired the real head of Death Row Records, a guy named Dave Kenner, a white lawyer. And within nine days of firing him, of course, he was killed. Yeah. And um, now I argue that uh, Death Row Records was a U.S. intelligence front company. A um, high-level uh, white Los Angeles police officer found dozens and dozens of his fellow police officers at all levels of Death Row Records. And he went to, when he went to his superiors to ask what were they doing there, uh, they said you can consider them covert agents. And one of their goals was to aid in the murder of Tupac Shakur. Yeah. And of course they had some other goals also, which was to, partly to end the Bloods versus Crips peace truce. But on a grander scale, isn't it somehow, if you look at hip-hop today, what it's become, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say from your conclusion that it might be also, is it actually a tool to, um, to suppress black people in general? In the 80s, for example, you had groups like Public Enemy right. that were uh, putting out activist lyrics, you had uh, Boogie Tribe Down Quest. Productions. Tribe Called Quest. All these Tried bands. Quest. Yeah, I mean, you know, these are all, these are groups that I liked a lot in the 80s and early 90s. And uh, I think the industry was taken over by the huge multinational corporations. The end of 1994 is when I started officially working for Delphi Records. 94. 94. We had got intel that um, a few of the guys that was working for Death Row Records was planning on robbing and kidnapping Shook or holding them for ransom. And so we met, I remember the corner, we met at this dairy on the corner of Long Beach and Murr. 
and uh, which happened to be in Southside Crypt area, <laughs> pretty much. I insisted I, that they get real security, uh -huh. real cops. <laughs> and and Shug was like, you know, he, he rubbed it off pretty much. I don't know if he believed it or not, but, you know, knowing Shug, he just like, yeah, yeah, well, I, you know, I'll deal with that. I don't believe that. Um, but that's why y'all need to be over here w watching my back anyway. Well, this is what happened. I, 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 I insisted they get real police uh -huh. because I didn't want to. I said, I, I just can't do this anymore. You know, this is crazy. I come to the studio and there's all these guys and it doesn't doesn't feel like, you know. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. My father was like, oh, man, half the guys that's working for you, I'm trying to get them on some cases myself. I'm not coming, you know, okay. I have no interest. So your dad turned it down? Yes. He but you did not? I didn't turn it down. Uh, however, at that point, I wasn't the one, the main guy. Uh, my father suggested another lieutenant uh, by the name of Danny Sneed. So, next time I go, there's real police. And this is then at the El Rey Theater. Well, when I looked at that, though, when I saw the first person get killed in front of me, that's when I realized this stuff is for real, man. These fuckers ain't playing around, buddy. And, yeah, El Rey, El Rey Theater. Uh, the El Rey yeah, Theater. but I don't remember any of the incidents. That was the dude that got beat up so bad. He got oh, he got... I'd never seen... It. I mean, I, I never saw anything like that in my life. But, no, I mean, they, 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 like, they split his head open and it, it just, the guts went, I mean, his head, and it just was like, whoa, I was just like, whoa. And then the, the, then the crazy thing was, the next day at death row, it back like nothing even happened. You know? And this company, Code 4 uh, Security, was the uh, security company, and I had some disagreements with the way things were done and felt that they didn't do things that they should have done. And I decided at that point that I was going to um, form my own security company. Okay. And then Suge hired right way? Right. Way after it ends, I found that they were Rampart guys. Eventually, yes. He hired right way. Uh, or I hired right way as, um, you know, the, the director or the chief of uh, security for Death Row. In 1995, there was a Source Awards. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank God. Second of all, I'd like to thank my whole entire Death Row family on both sides, you know what I'm saying? I'd like to tell Tupac to keep his guards up. We ride with him. And one other thing I'd like to say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to Death Rock. The East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and Death Row. Y'all don't love us. Y'all don't love us. We well, let it be known then. We, we know y'all East Coast. We know we at East Coast. Of We rode, we rode together, and uh, I think it was, I was excited in the moment to be on the Source Awards and to be on the stage, and you know, he told me, come on up here with me, you know, come up, so, you know, I went up on stage with him, and uh, you know, it was, uh, it was mostly a bad boy death row thing. But at that point, what he was doing, most people don't know, he and I had just got off a plane from signing the deal, and David Kenner, with Tupac Shakur. Now, you actually were with Suge when he started visiting Tupac in jail. Yes, I was. Okay. So, so describe, describe the first meeting that Suge had with Tupac in jail. I don't know what the meeting was like because the furthest I got was to the gate. So I had an opportunity to see the excitement of Pac coming to death row, you know, from Suge's eyes and from his mouth. But all three to four times that Suge and David Kenner went up there, uh, I was there as well. Okay, so were you actually sitting with Suge and Tupac? No, no, were... I stayed in, in the car. Okay. Yeah, I didn't go inside the prison. Got it. So since you were around, 
while Suge was working out his deal with Tupac. But one of the stories that you hear different sides of is that uh, Suge put up the bail money. But then another story is that the record label put up the bail money. Okay. In the movie, there's a scene where Tupac is calling Interscope Records to try to bail him out, and they, they front now, him. Now, he's calling about his braid. Okay. That's, you know what I mean? It's, it probably could have been developed a little bit more, but mm -hmm. they was basically trying to show how Pac was locked up. Old money. Remember, this man had the number one album while he was in prison. The first artist to ever do that. Yeah. You know, a million... A million sold back when a million scan was really a million records. Right. So that's between thirteen and twenty million dollars that he had coming to him. You mean this man don't got the money to pay his own bail and it's only one point three, one point five million dollars? Wow. Doesn't make sense. Um, his wife at the time reached out to Shug and just asked for some money. Shug shot fifteen thousand dollars, put it on his books. I said, hey, here's $15,000. If you need anything, call me. That's when Tupac reached out to Sugar and said, hey, come and see me. That's when they started talking, and Tupac was saying, hey, you know, they, you know my record company is doing, doing me wrong, which was Interscope. They, you know, they don't want no parts to deal with me. Right, but, but Sugar has a deal with Interscope as well. And a relationship. So I guess they, in their conversations, Jimmy was like, hey, you can deal with him. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of dealing with him. And that's when she was like, okay, we can make this happen. Hey, David, you think we can get him out on a PO bond? What can we do? Complex said you were top 25 and r of all time. Um, and in the, in the little synopsis they have of it, and they said, although Jimmy Iovine and Suge Knight eventually moved Gregory out of the picture by taking advantage of Shakur's insecurities and dangling beats from Dr. Dre as a bait. Do you think that's an accurate account of how you guys' working relationship ended, or is that hip-hop folklore, which a lot of no, that's that actually Yeah, because this, that guy introduced, uh, interviewed me. Okay. So that was pretty close. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, folk, the folklore is the bail. We're not going to get into that too deep. Okay. That's one thing I don't talk about. Um, I will talk about it, but I just don't generally talk about it. I never... I, what I will tell you is it's folklore. Okay. And I have the paperwork back there in the office. Wow. <laughs> you got to show it. We want to take a picture. I got to see that. I got to see that. 